So to make sure, to ensure that you're having a good time, we're going to start our keynote sessions. You know, we're very fortunate. We have two speakers who, you know, you know, I, who don't, either don't go by their full name or have very hard names to pronounce and make sure you don't ever pronounce them. So we're actually going to introduce them separately, but you know, real quick, we have Rommel and Valentin who are going to talk about some really large things with Postgres. And some of it's going to be philosophical, and some of it's going to take it to the applied world. Cool. So let's kick it off. So the first up's going to be Rommel. Um, he's really... Uh, Robert Lef Lefkowitz, um, all, it was really the first person that I ever met that went by something with a, a number in their name, um, which, which was kind of cool. I, I, I first met Rommel back in Nashville, Tennessee, of all places, um, where I went there talking about Postgres. Um, just didn't expect to be there in a big company and talking to somebody that was so enthusiastic about open source. Um, I expected to go in there, and we're in this, this big corporate building, um, and they're t more typically a Microsoft shop. But I'm in there in a meeting with this guy that's running around the room talking, all excited about open source. It was uh, a kind of an eye-opening experience in Nashville, Tennessee, of all places. Um, might expect that in the Bay Area or, or something like that. But uh, I was really excited when, when I saw a submission by, by Rommel to, to talk uh, he, at, at this event today, um, and then Jonathan and I looked it over a little bit, and we we're like, Rommel's not. We don't. We like hearing about the regular session talk, but I think everybody at the at the at the conference will get a lot more out of him as being the keynote speak. One of the keynote speakers. Um, it is. Uh, he's a fantastic speaker. Um, he is now here in U, uh, in New, the New York area. Um, really, New York City, right? Um, so, so he's no longer flying down to Nashville all the time. Um, so it's great having him as part of being the part of the New York Postgres community here. Um, so, so it's fantastic. And with that, uh, Ramo. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Let me uh, thank you, Jim, Jonathan, for inviting me here for for actually turning down the talk that I submitted. Um, it's, um, so actually, uh, Jonathan said that he wanted to have fog at this conference, um, and you can't do real fog, so we're going to have sort of virtual, conceptual, intellectual fog. That's, uh, that's what I'm going to provide. Uh, Valentine and I agreed, uh, yeah, he will do the informative talk, and I will do the confusing talk, um, so I'm going to talk about the image of Postgres. Uh, the way I do talks, what I would like to do, so this is what I'm attempting to do, you'll let me know later if I succeed, is to say something that's a cliche, that's a platitude that is so obviously true that it doesn't even bear saying or repeating. Except, I want to say it in such a way that you will feel that you can't agree with me. <clears throat> so I, I just want to deliver a platitude that <clears throat> you won't be able to agree with because of the way that I say it. So the platitude, because it's a Postgres conference, is Postgres is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> And the other thing that I do is I talk about philosophy, because the way that you get people to disagree with something that is obviously not disagreeable with is to become wax philosophical about it. So the philosophy that I usually try to, to specialize in is semasiology, and sometimes a little epistemology. But I'm sure you will all agree that epistemology is not appropriate for a database. Um, and so we're going to talk about ontology, because ontology is that branch of philosophy which is about the classification of things. And, and databases, of course, about the classification of things. And semasiology is the, uh, is the study of the change in the meaning of symbols over time. It's sort of the first derivative of semiotics. <clears throat> so where do we start with classification? We start with pasta. The reason we start with pasta is because I'm married to a Sicilian. 
and we used to fight about pasta all the time. Because my view is it's all the same stuff. Right? You make pasta, the same ingredients, and you just make different shapes of pasta. And then you get into arguments about, oh, which is the best pasta? Hey, which pasta should I serve? It's like it's all the same stuff. What difference does it make? Right? Pasta is pasta. What's the difference between pappardelle and macaroni? <clears throat> and we had this argument for years, and she could never explain to me what the difference was. And finally, just the other night, as I was preparing for this talk, and we were arguing about pasta, she explained it to me in a way that I finally understood. And she said, is the pro and it's an ontological insight. The problem is, if you think that pasta is food, you're mistaken. Pasta is a sauce delivery platform. <laughs> it's all about the sauce, but then if you, if you have a cheese sauce, you're talking macaroni or maybe vermicelli, depending on the consistency, right? So it's all about the consistency and the texture of the sauce. And based on that, you pick the pasta. But it's not about the pasta. It's about the sauce. So if you're thinking that it's about the wrong thing, if your ontology is wrong, then you come up with the wrong conclusions. And <clears throat> so the reason this is important is because when we say Postgres is awesome, we don't mean that it's awesome as a sauce delivery platform. Right? It's awesome as a database. So we should amend the platitude to Postgres is an awesome database. And we could leave it at that if we weren't waxing philosophical, because then the question is, what is a database? <clears throat> and as with pasta, if we think that a database is something that it is not, <clears throat> will be misrepresenting the awesomeness of it. <clears throat> so lest you think that this is about philosophy and not about computer science, the one book that I want to recommend for those people who want to get further into this is, I mean, this book was, was once on the list of the 10 most influential computer science books of all time, Understanding Computers and Cognition by Terry Winograd. And he talks about it, this sort of philosophical struggle about what things mean and, and you know, how that relates to computers and whatnot. And in, in particular, the insight that comes away from this book that's what I'm going to be focusing on today is his definition of communication is that communication is the thing that happens when you realize that the thing that you said is not the thing that the other person heard. So <clears throat> what is a database? And just like with pasta, I think people look at the word database and they say, oh, database, you know, it's like an army base. An army base is where you keep your army. A database is where you keep your data. Right? It's about, it's about the data. And so people think the mundaneum. Right, this place full of data, and you're organizing the data, and it's about the ontology of the data, and where you keep the data, and how you retrieve the data. And that was what databases looked like in the 1930s. <clears throat> and this is what databases look like today. They haven't changed very much, except you notice the person is gone from the picture. It's like all automated now. Right? Databases, databases are a place to keep your stuff. And a place to keep your stuff, as any computer scientist knows, if it's global, mutable, shared state, is a bad thing. Right? Programming language research is all about getting rid of your global, mutable, shared state. Right? So if a database is global, mutable, shared state, then it's a bad thing to begin with. So being an awesome bad thing is not such a good thing. We don't want to be an awesome place to store your data. Right? Because that's not really what a database is. So I want to ask the question a different way. It's not what is a database. What's the purpose of the database? Right, that's, how, that's how we got the insight into pasta. Right? Not is pasta food because you say, oh, well, of course it's food. You can't argue with that. But say, what's the purpose of pasta is to deliver the sauce. So what's the purpose of the database? What is the purpose of a database? Purpose of a database <laughs> is to obstruct access to data. Everybody knows this. Now, how do we know this? Right? Because if you, if you think, so, because <clears throat> a file system is where you store data. Right? If you just wanted to store stuff, you'd put it in the file system. 
So why would you get a database instead of just using a file system? Well, file systems don't do a bunch of things that databases do much better. And what are those things? You know, and these are the things that database people are always talking about. And I'll just pick one at random here, transaction isolation. And if you think about all of these things on this list, what are these things about? These things are about saying, oh, transaction isolation. That means that you know, there's certain things that you should not be allowed to look at at certain times. right? So it's about obstructing your access to the data at certain points. Everything about a database about obstructing your access to data. So you, it's sort of like a file system, only with more obstructions. And why is that a good thing? So I submit that a database is not a place to keep your data. I submit that the difference between a database and a file system is a database is a platform for enforcing your business rules. Because this is what people talk about when they're talking about databases also. They talk about schemas and default values, constraints. And these things are all business rules. And I learned this. I learned this in Nashville. Jim was talking about my commutes to Nashville. Because <clears throat> I, I took this job to, be, uh, to work on the data warehouse in, in Nashville. And during the interview process, I, I, one of the questions I asked was, so what's your biggest problem? And the answer was, the business guys are always upset because they want to know how many customers we have and we can't tell them. I said, this doesn't sound like a very hard problem, right? It's select count star from customer table, right? And they said, oh, no, you don't understand the problem. I said, OK, so illuminate me. What's the problem? And, and he said, um, well, it depends what you mean by customer. <laughs> See, because if you're selling cell phone insurance, is like, is the customer the person who has the cell phone account? What if they have two handsets and they're both insured? Is that two customers? What if it's a family account and he's got kids on the plan? Do they count as customers? They're not kind of. Well, it's a business account, and then you have like multiple people, and you have like a thousand people covered in the business, but you only have actually 700 people using it. So, how many customers you have? That's a business rule. So, figuring out what your schema is, figuring out how you organize the stuff, and what do you do in the database, that's all part of enforcing your business rules. You have to decide what these things mean. It's, it's an ontological problem. Right? You have to classify your knowledge and then enforce your business rules. I just want to take a check here, because my objective was to only say things that are patently true and hardly bear repeating. Is this patently true and hardly bears repeating? I guess so. <laughs> All right. So this is patently true and hardly bears repeating. Let us think about the typical web application architecture. <clears throat> and this, this architecture is called the three-tier architecture because it has four tiers. <clears throat> You have your browser, your web server, the thing that runs Python or PHP or JavaScript or Ruby or Java code, and then the database. And that's always how you do it. And why do you do it that way? Well, because, well, A, that's how everybody does it. Uh, I, I once saw somebody give a talk that says, history teaches us that this is the only right way to do it. <laughs> Which, as a philosopher, I had to sort of admire the logic that led to that conclusion. <clears throat> and because, because most people will say, oh, well, see, the database, that's the place where you keep your stuff. And then, and then you know, in this thing that runs your, your, your Ruby and PHP and Python code, that's where you have your business logic, because you don't want to put it in your uh, UI layer, right? Which is because, you know, MVC, you separate those things. But, you know, we're talking, we're at a Postgres conference. So, so this thing runs Python and JavaScript in Java too, right? So, so why doesn't your web architecture look like that? Other than the fact that that would make it a two-tier architecture, which we know is old-fashioned and wrong, and you shouldn't do it that way. Thoughts? I mean, this is, this is what stumped me over here. It's like, so one theory is because that 
Postgres doesn't run PHP. <laughs> and that, that would fix the problem. <laughs> Except, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's not the issue. Right? So, so why isn't, you know, why don't we, why don't we do things this way? Well, because, you know, there was a time when the browser was kind of dumb and you couldn't put any logic in there, and the databases were kind of dumb and you couldn't put any logic in there. Right? And so, okay, so I understand that there was a time when you needed that extra, that the third tier in that whole architecture, but those, you know, that's so 1990s. Right? We could do it this way. And the reason this works is because Postgres lets you run Python and JavaScript and Java code right in the database where you enforce your business rules just the same way as you would do somewhere else. And everybody says, well, that would never work. Why would that never work? Well, because it wouldn't scale. Why wouldn't it scale? Well, because, you know, if you're running Python inside Postgres, that wouldn't scale as much as if you were running Python inside Django. You know, because they're different. Because one's a database and one's an application server. <clears throat> so if you think of your database as the place where you enforce your business rules, then Postgres is an awesome database. And that is what I call some asiology. So now I said the same thing now as I said earlier when I originally said Postgres is an awesome database, when database, of course, meant a place to keep your data. And now I'm saying exactly the same thing, only I mean something completely different by it, because its meaning has changed. Are we still agreeing with this? And I have to phrase it in some way that you will not agree with it, even though I want to say the same thing. <clears throat> So as a philosopher, I'm not happy with the fact that everybody agrees with what I'm saying. So I will ask the same question again, not, not what is the purpose of the database, but what thing is a database most like? What thing is a database most not like? Like, what's the difference between a database and a thing which is not a database? Like, if a thing was, didn't look like a database, could you argue that it was a database even though it wasn't? So yeah, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to make that argument. This is the, the, the Byte Magazine cover from August of 1981. So in the 70s and the 80s, programming languages had this sort of unique perspective that's completely lost to history. Like, the way it worked was a programming environment was a virtual machine image. It was a complete copy of your entire virtual machine memory, and that was called the image. And then you loaded that up, and it had all your functions and your data in, in it. And then you ran that for a while until you were sort of done, and then you saved it out. And this wasn't just small talk. Lisp worked that way. APL worked that way. Programming environments worked that way. You know, it was kind of like Docker. Only it wasn't a separate thing because everything worked that way. Um, and so you didn't worry very much about persistence because it was implied. Like if you had a programming environment, it saved everything that you were doing in the programming environment. You didn't have to separate that part out. So a programming environment was a place where you kept all your data and business logic forever. Is that not the same thing as what Postgres does today? Keeps your data and your business logic, hopefully, forever. So then Postgres is kind of like small talk, only different. Right? Then what's the difference? Well, we took the UI out of small talk and put it in the browser. And then the rest of it is the same. So really, Postgres is an application delivery platform, you know, just like we had back in the 80s. Is it awesome at that? Because if it's a place where you're keeping your business rules, you say, yeah, small talk got it right. right? Sort of this environment where you can write your business rules, you can debug your business rules, you can version your business rules, right? and you can, you can use it as an application development and delivery platform. <clears throat> And so this is the part 
This is the part where I say all of these things that you say, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Which is true because these things change very fast. So one of the things I was going to point out is, like, oh, so, so the big difference between small talk and Postgres, of course, is that small talk had this awesome debugger. And there is no debugger in Postgres. How many people are familiar with the debugger in Postgres that lets you debug stored procedures graphically? Oh, this is the first time I've gotten hands going up. Yes, we have some hands going up, but not very many. So either the rest of you are shy, or you didn't know that there was a built-in graphical debugger somewhere in there, because it's sort of a carefully guarded secret. And my hypothesis as to why this is a carefully guarded secret is because everybody thinks, oh, Postgres is a database, which is a place to keep your data. So why would you debug anything in there? It's not a debugging environment. <clears throat> All right, so it's okay, so we'll move on. So what did we have back in 1991? You can see it there at the bottom there. This is, this is a version browser here, 1991, 1992. Built into programming environments, be they Smalltalk or Lisp or APL, way back in the 70s and 80s was anytime you changed anything, it versioned it, obviously, so that you could revert to the previous version. You could diff between these versions. So obviously, when you change a stored procedure in Postgres, it would do that. And it could, like how hard is that, right? It keeps the stored procedures in, in PG proc, it's just a table, right? You could have a version number or a timestamp and you know, select the most recent or the previous or whatever. You could use a foreign function extension, right? A, for, <clears throat> a foreign data wrapper, right? Yes. A foreign data wrapper and just talk to a Git repository or a subversion repository as if it were just data right there in the system. There's no reason that couldn't work. But we don't do that. Why don't we do that? Well, my hypothesis is we don't do that because we say, well, why, why would you want to, ver you can't version data. Versioning is it's like an application development programming business rule, business logic thing. You would do that to your code, but, you know, Postgres is it's not a code. So I, so I think that's, that's, a, that's another ontological error that people have. So this was my list that I came up with of those things that I would want in my application development environment, my two-tier architecture, right? I'd want a direct HTTP interface, obviously, which you could get maybe by, by having like an Apache module. Uh, if anybody wants an Apache module that goes directly into Postgres, I'm sure, what, does one exist? There's one on GitHub. So if anybody's interested, I, you know, got one there, mod PG. Um, you know, sort of a JSON REST interface. There's a bunch of companies that do that. I saw uh, there was uh, slash DB I came across, and there's one at this kind, next DB, I think. Uh, um, there's a bunch of people who do this kind of thing where they expose sort of Postgres directly as a REST interface to the web because you don't need that, you don't need Django sort of creating the JSON for you, right? I mean, you can create JSON directly in Postgres because it is an application development environment, <clears throat> right? We, you, you've, got, you, you've got Python, you've got, you've got, um, You've got Perl, you've got Tickle, right? You don't have PHP, which I guess is a huge problem. Um, <laughs> but not for me, because, you know, but I, but I like to have Haskell, right? Um, and so if anybody's interested in working on a, on a, on a, on a Haskell uh, add-in, uh, you know, extension so that you could write stored procedures in Haskell, that, I, that would be an awesome project. I'd love to work with you on it. Uh, check, call me. Uh, uh, version control. I think there's a number of ways you could solve that. That's sort of a, a problem that's sort of not solved in the core. EDB may have a solution, for all I know. I don't know. Um, but, but it seems like you should expect that it would be there. Um, the, to be able to diff, they, you know, it's like, oh, I got two databases. Like, are the stored procedures the same between the two of them? Can I just diff that? Like, like I do a git diff. I should be able to do a PG diff. There's one of those on GitHub. For, you know, these, but, but you know, they're not, they're not in the core. And of course, the debugger, which exists, but I haven't been able to figure out where to get it or how to use it. Um, but, but I'm working on it, uh, because that would be cool. Anyway, and if, if you had all of this stuff, um, <laughs> you could think about Postgres in a completely different way. <clears throat> I call it transgress. Um, but Postgres um, is an awesome database is where I started out. It was the platitude that I was going to work with, and it would almost work, except if it's missing all of these things, then, then I think what I'm really trying to say is um, Postgres would be so much more awesome, if only. 
and, 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 and the finishing that sentence is the part where we're going to get more disagreement, so I'm just going to sort of leave it at that. <laughs> because I think, you know, I think that's why we, we sort of gather at this conference is, is, is to figure out ways to make Postgres better um, and not to rest on our laurels, even though Michael Stonebreaker just got the Turing Award. So, so a little of that reflected glory, I think, cast upon Postgres. <clears throat> and um, that was all I had to say. Postgres would be so much more awesome, if only. <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks.